Welcome to One Step Ahead program for 2023. This is our first presentation. We are looking at refereeing 101, so back to the basics. What is it that we need to achieve to deliver to get the outcomes required in our games? Let's go through some basics today. First aspect, skills and skill acquisition. Unless you know what the referee skill areas are, how to acquire them, how to improve your own ability in each of those areas, you can forget about any upgrade situation. You can forget about great game outcomes. So unless you have already acquired the skills, which take some time, it's not easy, you need to be able to set yourself up with a program in place or an idea around what you're doing with timeframes to really focus on each area and understand what we need to achieve great game outcomes. Okay, It's critical to successful officiating of every game of touch football to ensure that you know what they are and be able to perform them. Now, our performance indicators are clearly aligned with our badge levels and the evidence in our competency sheets. You can go to the nest, interview documents, and download any of those competency sheets at any time. Before you go for any upgrade, you need to understand what those competency sheets mean for the upgrade level that you're going for and ensure that you understand which aspects on those sheets are compulsory aspects to achieve. Every single performance level if you like or every single badge level has a different expectation of performance and it's it's really important that you understand that as well so let's have a look at some of these referee skill areas there are six now from our level three competency sheet onwards they are listed in this order our level one our foundation sheet and our level two sheet don't have them listed like this however if you're looking at the key aspects teamwork our seven meters, which is the most important part of the game, must work. Now, that can be working as the core referee on the field or central referee on the field, setting the seven meters with our one or two buddy referees, depending on the situation, supporting to get the wing and link on side. It's really important that all of us work together when we are on a game. We have to be in sync. The only way that we can get the best game outcomes possible is to do that. It also helps us reduce player frustration, leading to less conflict, and it enables us to share the workload better. So on fast games, it's important that we're not on the field for more than two minutes at a time. Okay. Obviously, it's beneficial if we have three referees to make that the case, but we need to maximise our energy use and not become fatigued quickly, otherwise that leads to unforced errors or mistakes. So a second aspect, communication. Arguably the most important aspect, but it must be done confidently clearly and as early as possible and on the run. So it must be targeted and specific. You'll see some examples later of, around this, which are not necessarily targeted and specific. They do get outcomes. They do get responses from players, but obviously it's not as fast. Remember, we always say this, if we had, if we knew player names and every player name, a player name is going to be the quickest way to respond. If you only know some player names to, to be fair in the game, you should be using numbers. If you can't see the numbers, then positions. But if we use that first, we give someone the idea of what who we're talking to first and then give the instruction, we're always going to get a better outcome. Think about a classroom situation when you were at school or uni. If somebody used your name first to get your attention and then what you wanted, you were much more prepared and switched on to answer the question or respond to the requirement than if they said this long spiel or stated something and then your name or number because you may have missed it. Okay, really important that we have the quickest response possible to give everyone a chance to have early opportunity to rectify any issue, which then avoids penalties in most cases cases and makes the game more free-flowing. Okay, thirdly, match awareness and positioning. We have to identify the key players early to ensure early response to play. We have to ensure that we have player prioritization correct and early so that we can move into the right position. Now, often referees prioritize the wrong player when they are just new and developing. That's because they're identifying the player making the touch. That's not the next player that we want to focus on. It's the next player set to impact on that attack. Okay, so it's usually a secondary defender who's already dropped back to set with you or who's moving back, preparing themselves to be ready. We do need to ensure that players are moving with intent and purpose, especially around the try line. And we need to be clear and consistent with that across our referee team. Okay, so match management is the fourth one. Need to be aware of interchange protocols. Our own transitioning and timing in response to game standards and speeds. Know the plays and attack def and defense strategies 
and know when to listen and when to observe as the primary sense to support positioning, movement and response. If we can get all of those aspects correct, we can manage the game more effectively. Okay, if we have great game awareness and are able to manage players around or through that, that aspect, that makes it much easier for us. Our fifth aspect is the referee systems. That's all around interchange awareness, subbox management, transition position, and timing and preparation for effective interchanging, early specific communication to players. Now, what that basically means is we need to know when is the good time or the right time to interchange. We need to know what and how to manage the subbox, like what to look for and how to manage that. We need to know how to transition into positions effectively to ensure that we're timing our preparation for interchanges. And we need to ensure that we're communicating as early and as targeted and specifically as we can to players to get the best outcomes from them. Our sixth and final referee skill area is try line. If we are consistent with our proximity, we keep a clear line of sight, we are always going to be able to see and make clear decisions. Now we may still make a mistake, but if we are close to the play, if we can see what's happening, players will accept the mistake if we are in a position that means we are close to see it. If we are not in a position where we are close to see it or we have a line of sight blocked, players, and rightfully so, may contest that or not be happy with our decision. Leads to more frustrations that we don't need in the game. Okay, next, standoff management, anticipation of long ball. If you understand those two aspects and what to look for, obviously helped by your game awareness, then you're able to move more effectively and get players to move more effectively. So think about your standoff management. You might have a generic statement that you use to start with, okay? Moving forward. You might then realize as a player not moving forward as effectively as they should be, six, move forward. They may still not be moving forward as you want. You move close to them to ensure that you're moving with them. So active management now, using proximity, using your own body to move forward to show them what you're expecting. Ensuring that if you're doing that, you don't get caught out on the next play coming forwards. All of these aspects are really important for us and need to be thought out, practiced, and then put into place. Our key referee elements, here they are, six of them. We've mentioned them already. They are core skills. Here are the skills within those. So we need to understand how and when to move. We need to understand how and what to look for. We need to understand what to say and when to say it to be most effective. We need to look for incidents and infringements in the roll ball or the ruck area. We need to understand the difference between a roll ball infringement and an offside infringement following the roll ball in that that changes where the mark for that incidence will be. We need to look at and understand attack strategies and plans, defense strategies, we need to consider what game concepts and strategies may be put in play, understanding that a mixed game will be different to a men's game, which will be different to a women's game, all have different structures and strategies. And we have to ensure that our athletic performance is at a standard that meets the requirements of that game, if not exceeds it. So if we do not put those things in place, we do not ensure that we know all those things, we cannot guarantee the best game outcomes for that. So, you may or may not have heard of Priority 10. The Priority 10 is a structure that's in place for players. If you understand those 10 factors, here they are, then you can work out why it's important that we understand it. So, a dominant touch in the roll ball is Priority 1. We need to look for minimal force, positioning and the use of the space, thinking about the pre-roll ball and post-roll ball possible infringements, and what, if any, impact us identifying those early enough can have, in that we can talk people out of penalties. We can support on the run with verbals and non-verbals. Okay, there are plenty of other things we can do as well, but that is the dominant touch roll ball situation. Moving on to defending space. For us as referees, the defender wants to get to their position and get up fast in multiple cases, not necessarily off the try line, but to shut down the play on the drive. We need to be able to look at the timing of the defensive movement forward in those instances and control that. 
So we want to preload. We want to talk to them about what we want. Time you run. It can be that simple. Okay. We have to pick up early shooting early to ensure that that player has a chance to get back on side. We don't want to rule someone out of the game because we're too slow in identifying what we need. Defensive profile is number three. So our knowledge of defensive shape and lanes can help us predict and read play early, ensuring that we can actually move into a good position early enough to see what may come. Pre-touch is number four. Our management of the pre-touch items are the players on side. Can we manage the touch itself? Are we setting an early seven meters to ensure that every both teams understand where things are? Are we using non-verbals as well as verbals to identify offside players to both benefit the attack to know who's offside, but also to give the defender the opportunity to get back on side? Five, attacking lines. Knowledge of basic plays, players in motion. All of that helps us predict the next play and get to that next critical position to ensure that we're in a good position for the next play. That helps us set up and stay aware and keep and maintain players onside, game awareness, etc. as we go. Six, attacking sequences, conditioning defenders. So being aware that there are variations to plays which are often run after a single variation of that play is run to condition players as to that's what they should expect, then the variation occurs. This occurs more in high quality games where your players know and understand the game really well. It also shows that our awareness and a slight change in movement pattern or player position can make a huge difference in the game. So being aware of those alternate plays or possible variations so that we don't overcommit is really important for us. Seven, attack scanning. So awareness of set plays and timing of checking the onside players is really important, as well as the movement of players so that they can take advantage of any attack scanning. So there are drills that are done by attack and defensive teams on that kind of scanning. It is important that if you are not aware of those at all, that you try to get some information out of some of your elite or talent ref coaches, not referee coaches, but actual player coaches, to learn some of those aspects. And we can all learn from each other. We don't have to just rely on referees and referee coaches all the time. Elite players and elite coaches are critical to our own development to get to that next level. So opening up the doorway and the pathway for all of us to openly have conversations around these aspects I believe is our next step that's really important that's usually missing. Number eight, passing for advantage. So allowing advantage to occur and be taken rather than returning for penalties all the time. That's what it's all about for us in terms of referees. We need to look for the ability to apply advantage early, but we also need to look for the ability to identify what the issue is early for players to make sure that they're able to get on side, for example, or whatever else the case may be. Nine, phase play. So understanding when and where change of pace occurs, style of game occurs, uh, that helps us be in the right position and not be caught out, especially as we're moving from the central field towards the try line. That change of pace and style of play is critical to understand then so that we don't get caught out. And 10, switch attack. Understanding the purpose of switch plays and reading the change of motion in players before or as they're doing it is really important so we can be in position nice and early. All right, so there are seven skills or steps to skill acquisition. Perform the skill. Anyone can perform the skill without any real detail. Be able to perform the skill well is the next one. So the more you practice and practice regularly, the more and easier the skill will become. As you get to learn the skill more, it will become second nature, but not yet. So performing the skill well and now at speed is the third step. Performing the skill well at speed and under fatigue, which is something we don't often trial or practice. Perform the skill well at speed, under fatigue and under pressure. Now this is difficult to simulate, but it is important that we can do it. Perform the skill well at speed, under fatigue, under pressure in competition conditions now. So looking at those elite games or the next level up game to what we're used to. And then perform the skill well at speed, under fatigue, under pressure and competition conditions consistently. So our top level referees do that for the majority of the time. Okay, we're not saying it has to happen all the time, but the more that you can do it and put it in place, obviously the better the game outcomes will be and therefore the better your performance will be. All right, so let's move on from skill development. There's plenty more we could have talked about there, but I'll leave that for you to think about.
I would suggest that you go away, think about it, contact your referee coaches, contact your referee mentors, contact myself if you need to, to have further conversations if there's clarity needed. All right, but drills and grids are the next thing we're moving on to. We need to look at some examples of these. So we're going to look at some TFA endorsed drills. We're going to look at some SQD endorsed drills. So first of all, TFA endorsed drills. These were designed by Ken. So thank you to Ken. They can be available and found in the nest. So you just go into the docu document library. There are 11 of those. I've listed them there on the left hand side. Giving you two examples here. These are two that I use regularly. Um, one is setting up seven meter. So moving down the field, you can add in different things that occur or possibly occur as you want to get more complex. Um, but it's getting used to judging that seven meters. Okay. Ensuring that we're not setting in front of the head of the roll wall as we move. There's more information on each of these uh, referee skill drills if you want to go and have a look. Second one on there, it's a nice little drill with options. So you're going in towards the try line as you're moving, and then options are thrown at you on what you need to do. That's really important because we can't practice effectively try line work without either gameplay or these kind of scenarios set up. So if you haven't looked at any of these before, I really strongly suggest you do. They're really nice little grids and drills that you can run through in your own time, in your own space, limited resources required, and basically learn more about and practice more around those issues. I recommend for new referees who are still learning consistent seven meters, which is which are most level one referees and a lot of level two referees, set your cones up to run to the points where the player would be rolling the ball. Take a different set of cones if you have access to that. Drop them as you set your seven and walk back through and have a look. Is that where you consistent? Does it actually look like seven meters? Measure it if you're not sure. Think about what difference you're making as you go and what else you've done around any of that. Okay. So some SQD endorsed drills. So ones that I've found or drawn up. None of these I've designed myself, but they're all drills I've used over the years. So the end drill, top center, very common drill, enables you to come up off the try line, back on an angle as you're following play to set up off the try line. And then with that second up of the try line, we're signifying or trying to orchestrate the fact that it would be a changeover. And then we're driving to the box. So we're sprinting to the sub box. So it could be that or it could be an intercept, you know, either or. But you're, seeing, you're going up, back on an angle, up, and then sprinting through. Okay. So the L drill then, far left at the top. You're starting at the top where the star is. We're running backwards and someone else is there to tell you which way to go so that you're you're reacting to play whichever way the ball would have gone so say left and you run across back to the middle forwards and then come back again right etc etc you can do it without anyone yelling out which way to go initially so you can practicing driving off each side to follow play <coughs> or to follow for a long ball um, but it's a good little technique to start doing, especially with someone else who's going to call randomly which way to go, give you good practice to sprint out there and back. Your next one is your X drill in the middle at the bottom. Same kind of concept. We're going forward, angle back to the try line. Okay, forward, angle back to the try line if you like. Directional movement uh, across the grid. There's options are plenty. Okay, sometimes you'll be called across the try line, other times out to the seven meters, depending on what. You're wanting to do you can run the grid straight up angle back across the try line angle forward straight back okay there are plenty of different ways you can run the x, x grid so moving on to w grid you go forwards backwards angle out angle back to the try line forwards backwards okay and continue and then the slave and weave drill is a very common one in other forms of football you're basically running forwards the entire time, running around each of the markers, accelerating, decelerating to try to get the fastest time possible. So you come down, around, up, around, down, around, up, around, sprint out. Critical parts to that in terms of lowering your speed are learning how to keep your balance while you accelerate and decelerate around markers. Okay, acceleration and deceleration are really critical components that I can't recommend more strongly that you practice 
as part of your running technique for refereeing. Next set then, so we have deceleration drill, so the middle, you sprint to the seven meters stop, lower in a lunge position, sprint to the seven meters stop, repeat on the opposite leg, repeating each of those motions. Okay. So once you get to one end, you come down the other end of the markers and lowering in the lunge position on the opposite leg, if that makes sense. So you might start on the left-hand side, sprint, drop down on your left-hand foot, sprint, same thing, sprint, come to the other side, to the right-hand side, sprint seven meters, lunge down on the right-hand foot, sprint, continue, sprint, continue. Uh, next one, gate shuttle drill. So you sprint up and back seven meters, up and back 14 meters. Um, so gate shuttle drill, you sprint up and back seven meters, up to the 14, back to the seven, up 14, back seven, and sprint through. You can add a position further down if you wish to. That's what most people have. But otherwise, this little drill is a good one to sprint up, back, up, back, up, back, and just get you used to moving like that. So next one is your lateral shuffle drill. So you start on your left marker, set yourself low and balance, shuffle to the outside of the right marker, and return to your start position. You usually do that a few times, have a rest to go again or alternate going the opposite way. Crosshair drills, this is a soccer drill, but it does come in handy for that acceleration deceleration. So you run to the middle cone, turn right, run to the bottom cone, return to the middle cone, okay, and repeat that process all the way around. Then you might run the grid turning left all the way around. All right, so it's, just, it's just that change of direction, movement around, change of direction, movement around to get that agility and strength in your ankle as you're moving like that. Last one is your diagonal square drill. Again, very similar. You sprint to the middle marker, turn left, run around the marker, returning to the middle marker, repeat until you've done all of them. Then you may repeat doing right. Okay, I'm not gonna leave these up here forever. Welcome to pause this. I'm happy to print stuff or email stuff to you, whatever. Um, again, they're all just examples. Now we have some FitLab ones, so thank you to the FitLab, they've got the gate change timed. If you've done any of their testing, you will have done some of these tests. So I'm not going to go into too much information, but sprint forwards, utilize your balance, accelerate, decelerate. If you are elite, you will go around that 20 meters in under eight seconds. May not sound hard, try it and come back to us. Next one, 10 meter sprint. If possible, obviously with timing gates, you can get your time without any human error in terms of starting stopping, but 4.8 seconds to run 10 meters is elite. All right, three hop distance. So you do three hops on your left foot, measure it, three hops off your right foot, measure it, three hops off both feet, measure it. If you have less than 10% difference between your feet, then you are doing really well. And if you're getting eight meters plus on all three options, then you are considered elite. So think about difference. If you have one leg, you're getting your eight meters plus, one you're getting seven, both you're getting seven and a half, consider what you need to do in terms of preparation or strength and conditioning to that other leg to get it up there. Last one, O2 test, so oxygen test, simply sprint up, back up, back up, back up, back, then you sprint your seven meters, 70 meters, sorry. If you can repeat it and get it under two meters, then you're elite. Okay, you can run with angles, you can run straight up and back, totally up to you. But again, these are all just options around ways that you can try to practice more to improve what you're doing. Okay, so <clears throat> skills and drills out of the way. We're now going to do some video analysis. I want to look at some referees in action. Please remember that the referees in these videos are not all elite referees. We have some level ones, some level twos, some level threes, some level fours, some level fives, and some level sixes. Hopefully that you'll see across there. Um, key to this is we're not out to attack anyone we're not out to put anyone down this is a learning and development tool please utilize it solely and purely as that look for things that they are doing well look for things that they may be able to improve consider that upon yourself and those that you work with and how you can use them to help that or help yourself so first one so what's the position of the sideline referee in this first video uh raptors finish on top of the ladder so nice yes that's true that so Talking to him, uh, pointing out what's happening, out two best probably telling teams him the whole. Out here tonight. Yeah, definitely, mate. Yeah, no surprises back. to see it start hot. Look at the speed of it already. They're not going to interchange. It's hot on position. the field, but it's a cold night. Past the sideline so that he can manage those players. 
across the Masters Second. divisions and the Opens divisions as well. So, so nicely to change yeah. the so position prior to the subset. Yeah, big training camp today. They've been training for a whole day and now they're back here playing footy tonight, mate. They love it. They love it. <laughs> they are indeed. So we see young Corey Barrett. He uh, took out the Mixed Division 1 title, number 88 out there. Loves it. Off to Gary Sonder. Young uh, Dean McDonald in the so in the link out there for Raptors. He's only a young fella. Jaden oh, Love. Jayden Love. Set by Jaden. I don't think they'll catch him. Down. Making sure that they're watching Lush and the the And we're in Michael Jordan's number two. There you go. And all there you go. So that's probably a little for a referee coming in late, but they were there. But, but okay. not Top very good body up. position there on the touch by Corey. Now, so, oh, okay. there we go. Here we have. Yeah, nice. So, I was just about to say, nice to see the referees, John Vickland, Lee Rosso and Damian Miller. Time. Here in the game, John Bicklin, like I said earlier, is representing at the State of Origin for Queensland. And Lee Rosso is our referee director for our region here, for the South Queensland Sharks. Uh, Damian Miller is one of the referee coaches in the club, so nice to see these uh, three guys being rewarded with the grand final. Doing I want you to look for the sideline. Come back the other yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, like oh. And they sneak oh, on the outside of Chris Jensen there. there. Didn't get the try though. No, we're pulled out by the referee. referee. So well defended. For their sub box management as they drive up the field. It's a little bit of an arm wrestle. Yeah, yeah. Moment. We're going oh, into it. Which is great to see. It's only been 10 minutes, mate. Scores 2 1. He's talking to the wing and left. He's a little bit now lost on this subset. The sub box, yeah, Clancy picks it up. Managing all of those changes, reminding them of what they need. Paulie finds a side tricker. Um, to run it. To run it in Nathan Jones. Yep. And I like a uh, little wee county's rap to get the overlap again. Yeah, so goes you always get the middle and the touch, and he's always going to corner. So we're looking at uh, four sets in total here for the player that was sent to the bin. That's right, one so each, two each. This is the uh, second set for the Raptors. As so we'll see if Tiggers can defend with this set. Sideline position, sideline rest position, nice and close to the player. Close to the play. Recoil, look at that. Yeah. It oh, he still puts it on him. Good touch. So Tiggers need to complete this set here and they'll get their full complement back. There we go. Big energy on the turn. Now boys will just go the safe side. It's great meters. Nah, that's right. Last one, looking at the referee's position for this try. As the right player oh, runs out wide the and they Open die. Oh, my there it is. It's nice and yeah. low. Watching yeah, where it is. He's, he's just time a freaky. Okay, so looking at key aspects for this next one, it's a level one referee, so we're looking to be picky. Referee is square, just off from the head of the rubble. He moves on an angle to follow the ball. See him mirroring the play, comes through turns nice and early to see and watch the ball being rolled. Just hit seven meters here as he was slightly too close. These are all key aspects as you're learning how to develop and control the game from move from level one to level two or three. In this one, I want you to listen to the loud, audible voice of the referee. See that they're using non verbals as they move, try and get players in position, and they're mirroring the ball nicely. They're squaring up after every touch. Yes, they may be late in setting sometimes, but they're doing all these other aspects well that helps them manage the game. What you'll see here is a late touch and pass. There. Really good to see that referee moving from level one to level two standard and calling the decision, not letting the play move on, making the decision and then running through to set their 10. Maximizing their management and control on the field, which they needed to do as there are only two referees in this game. Okay, right. Checks, 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 checks. 
Fire and Bomber non-verbals identified six or so early made a step back, ensuring those non-verbals are linked with, with, with verbals, gets those players on side nice and clear. See the side that we've re identified also being linked to be on side, if I can get them on side. And the centre referee here as the ball goes to ground, urgency as they run to it, really comes to get players on side turning, ensuring that the players can see what's happening. Or at least he can see what the players are doing. Next one, look at the entry here from this level two referee. Already in play, already set, giving them a nice straight line or position for their seven. Squaring up, providing non verbals as they go. Sprints through, could have moved or turned much earlier to keep an eye on the ball, but that's okay. Got there. Mirroring the ball well, so moving it's out of sight now for a bit. You can see that he's mirroring the ball and comes back in. Able to move in the right direction the majority of the time means it's got decent game awareness, which is always good. And this game is not a slow game, it's being able to handle it quite well. Look at his sights, he's shorter than them, so his little legs having to work hard, but he's doing a really good job to move into position early. Here he sets up and then exits because the ball comes in. It's good game awareness by himself and his buddy referee. So now we're looking at some of our elite referees in action. Jordan Randall is on the field at the moment. See that he's moving nice and early. Having early player identification inside and offside. Read the play for the long ball early. Inner changes off. Brett Freshwater comes on. That's a good amount of pressure there from Flanagan. You'll see the same kind of thing from Brett Freshwater. Early identification there. He was already set. He's out of picture, I know, but he's doing the same thing here. So you'll see, Sets, he's only talking to that next defender outside him and identifying him still offside when he gets onside. Really good referee. Transition, not the smoothest here for New South Wales. Dutton, dropped it off on the last. Here is Edwards, Edwards at Hazel, just trying to find a little gap. So there's plenty of time for the world. It changes the play I'd run through, so it's almost like a dead play. Campbell Muir comes on. The we'll see the same thing from He's there early, talking to them. I know he's out of sight. He's already pointing for that next player to get on side. He holds his seven a little bit longer Maybe in that instance to ensure that they knew where the mark was. Queensland making it look easy, moving themselves up into the, the danger zone of New South Wales. That man there and he gets himself in nice and deep to get some angle on. Cross, Whilst he's not close to play, his sideline referee is perfectly in place. And Campbell had a nice yes, open view by running deep on that play. Queensland back into the ascendancy. And another try for Katie Mallor. I think that might be her hat trick. Good pass from Hegedus. So you see nice again, ball, moves back. Play goes out the way to get it down. Nice deep. Sideline referee, perfect position. So listen to the riders here. He's nice and loud. Here, keep coming, keep working. Second, they're pointing to players. With me, girls, he says. So he's not using specific or targeted comms, so that's what he needs to work on. But he is getting his comms out early enough for them to react and know what he wants from them. You will notice all of his communication is post touch, there's no preloading or not much preloading. So that's the other aspect that he needs to work on, especially in this try line area, making sure he gets his comms in nice and early, gives them the best opportunity to be on side early. Okay, now I'm moving on to a level 4 referee at the time. Notice the difference with the targeted specific language. So moving forward 28. Hopefully you can hear all the communication going on there. Twenty eight, stay forward, stay forward, into a nice position, reminding them what they want. Sideline referee supporting with forward. Really great Hazel example of preloading and communicating with players. So I'd encourage you if you can't hear the volume, turn it up, do what you need to do to, to get there. Play it again if you're not sure. So there's really strong try line communication. Is that the right line? Last one, the one referee. 
mirroring the play as the ball comes back out on this next play. Sprinting with urgency to stay running tight and deep. Ensure he has a clear view and staying out of the way of play. It's really nice work, especially for a level one referee to be in that position. Watch it again. Looks like the play's coming to the left because of the sweeper. Doesn't overcommit. Sprints through, runs deep to stay out of the way of the players. Follows. Nice clear open line. Try it done. Well done. So, moving on from that then, my advice to you, don't go chasing that next badge. Okay. Badges are not everything. What I will say though, is instead of chasing it, chase development opportunities. Utilize your time with your referee mentors and coaches. Prepare yourself properly for tournaments, and this will improve your game outcomes, not just for that one game, but for all games. If you are at your best, you can perform at your best for everyone, regardless of the game standard. Last thing, if you don't get the right support, you won't be able to achieve everything you need to achieve. If you get the right support and you put in the effort, you will have success on and off the field. That's my guarantee to you. Contact me if you need any advice or support. Utilize your referee coaches and mentors. We're always here to help, happy to help. We want you to improve. We want to every referee to give, get the best game outcomes possible out of their games. Like always, contact me for anything else. Otherwise, thanks for listening. I hope this was helpful.